Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Melcher, and I'd like to welcome you to the Future of Storytelling Virtual Roundtable Conversation Series. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to join us uh, at the live event, the Future of Storytelling was a, a summit that happened this last October, where we brought 300 amazing people together to talk about how technology is changing the way we tell stories. The heart of the day were these amazing 15 speakers who came and led roundtable conversations with small groups. Uh, these were fascinating and, and engaging discussions, and our goal with the roundtable, the virtual roundtable conversations, is to continue those discussions online. We we're only able to have 300 people join us live at the, at the event, but through the power of Google Plus Hangouts, we can open it up to the entire world. So I want to welcome every, everyone from, for being here, and particularly send out a, a thanks to Damien Kulash, who's our uh, lead discussion topic or, or speaker today. Damien led some really great conversations, as well as performed live at the event. Uh, he is the lead singer and guitarist of the band OK Go, which I'm sure you all know their incredible music videos, some of the most popular online music videos of all time. Uh, Damien, welcome. Glad to have you here with us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we also have some uh, illustrious guests in our roundtable chat today, and I thought we'd take a minute and ask everyone to just quickly introduce themselves. Mike, why don't you start? Uh, sure. My name is Mike Rosenthal, and uh, actually I work uh, with the band OK Go doing a lot of their digital strategy, and I also run their independent record label, Paracadute. Oh, well, welcome. And I am uh, Jacob Marshall. I started a band called May about a decade ago and had the pleasure of uh, playing with Damien and the a OK Go guys back in, I guess it was 2007. We were on tour with The Fray. And uh, now I am the senior connector at More Partnerships, where we focus on building collaborations between corporations, artists, and causes. Welcome. Hey, Daria. Hi, um, I'm Daria, and um, I'm a singer-songwriter. As a lot of people know, I'm the girl who sort of started hangout concerts here on Google+, and i um, completely in love with the community here. And uh, you guys have been carrying me all over the world to amazing things like Future of Storytelling. I was so honored to be one of the speakers and performers at FOST um, this past fall, and it was so cool to meet you there, Damien, and I'm really excited to be here. Welcome. Hi, Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Phillips, and I'm a transmedia writer and game designer, which means that I tell stories that go across multiple platforms, particularly uh, across social media. I'm not a musician. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Alita Brandenburg. I um, was an early suggested user on Google+, and have been on there since pretty much day one, actually absolutely since day one. Um, huge new media enthusiast, uh, big fan of music. I work at Pandora. Um, so really excited for the topic today and to be able to contribute. Fabulous. Welcome, everyone. I also want to say to those who are watching us live through Google Plus or YouTube um, that we're open to your questions. So please feel free to write in and, and share your thoughts. Um, but I thought we might start it off with, with some questions from our group. So Daria, why don't you? Why don't you start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I hope everybody got a chance to watch Damien's awesome future storytelling video. And I was going to reference it, so maybe he and I can both give context if people out there haven't seen it. But there was a really fun part of the video where Damien uh, had a makeshift chalkboard. And you were doing a sort <laughs> of free, freeform chart about um, sort of all cultural ideas and the space that those things can happen inside of. And there was TV and music and internet and but it was fun. If you haven't watched it, go and watch it. But in the video, you ended up with Red. And Red was like the cool new space, but it's just in that sweet spot where there's something fresh and a really cool space for people to work in. But it wasn't all the way out to the edge of like novelty and stuff that's going to be lame in a couple of months. And so, <laughs> um, so my first question to you was, what's Red to you right now? Um, as another young artist who, who's doing this kind of stuff, I would love to know wh what space you're excited about and what's, what's piqued your interest lately. Um, well, I, th I think the the way I should have said that probably was that <laughs> um, it, it is is that I, I think that good I 
good ideas are, are, are generally platform agnostic. Sometimes they're platform dependent, but they're not, uh, see that, that, those are contradictory, but the, <laughs> uh, what, what I don't like are ideas that are, that, that are born of, an, of the, the possibility that something new can be done and that's where it stops. That, 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 oh, you know, phones are fast enough with their connections to the internet now that we can have video on phones, so therefore we have to do some sort of video that requires you to have a phone and it's much cooler. It's, unless it's a good video, it's a bad video. It doesn't really matter what technology it's using. And so um, it's hard to tell sometimes when, when a new space opens up whether or not ideas are good because they're good or they're, or, or they're good because they're novel. And so right now, I guess that the you know the, the area in the video that I was talking about was sort of like if you if you you know music used to be contained in uh, on a CD or before that uh, you know on a record or for a while there in the eighties and nineties it was sort of like it, it, music was everything that you could do on a CD or a, a tape, including like a little bit of an outlet at at MTV as long as you're la as long as you had really big funders in the form of a record label and you hired somebody else to make the film for you you know there's Right. The, the medium keeps changing, and you know, and television and video and um, storytelling, every, you know, publishing, all sorts of things are sort of all lumping into this ones and zeros category now, where that is the, that's the whole medium. Right. Um, and so, what you think of as music can change, or what you think of as your your creative project can change. So having so ha that's sort of what, what's in in the video, and I guess the area I'm most excited about right now. I mean, we're, the, the band is, is, is kind of hiding making a new record right now. So most of my days at this month are, are spent in a very traditional sort of songwriting structure. Um, and that said, we're putting out, um, our, our, our guitarist Andy has written a game. He's a computer programmer and he, he wrote a really good game. So we're releasing it um, the same way you would release a song or an album. Um, and I think in, in general, we're, we're, we're excited to see like what, what happens when we make this set of songs, when we launch ourselves into the universe again in you know, six months with all these songs, what are the ways that they can, what are the lives they can take on? They don't have to live on just a CD. In fact, they don't have to live just in the three and a half minutes of the song. Like you can, you can start to get other versions of them. We could do sort of dynamic versions that have remix possibilities or get our fans involved or get other musicians involved that we could release them one by one. We could release them as a whole group. I mean, and those sort of new possibilities, um, those are exciting to me because there's a, there's a creative outlet in, in those as well as there is in the songwriting itself. Yeah, that's so cool. I totally agree. I'm excited to, to see the game and see what you guys are working on. That's the kind of stuff I've been I've been tinkering with in the studio too. So um, it's really cool. I I think I mentioned in my post about this hangout. I said Damien's like the really cool young grandfather of all of this stuff that I feel like we're <laughs> doing now. <laughs> and when well, I met you guys, so I felt so thank you for for bushwhacking for for all of the rest of us and um. Mm. Excited to for the rest of the combo. So thank you. That's Thanks. Cool. I, I will say, you know, one of the things, like, what I like about Andy's game is that it's a good game. Yeah. Um, I can't say a lot about it because it's it, it'll be a couple months till we can say much about it. But um, where I think a lot of bands have gone wrong, or or at least where people are sort of just limited in their imagination, is that people are going, oh, there's all these new outlets. They've got to be great promotion for my music. If, if our videos were truly promotion for our music, they'd be miserable. They're just good videos, you know. And if and if if the game, like I mean, there's plenty of bands that release apps, except that they're 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 aimed directly at their existing fan base. As hey, if you really love us, then look, you can have a, a, like some other dimension of us, you know. And um, what Andy wanted to make was a game that you don't have to like the band at all. It's not about the band. It's a it's a great game, and and hopefully you like the 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 cultural work, not the not the context around it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And as artists, I think it's so fun to have other ways of expressing our, our creative stuff, you know, so it's, it's healthy to push it out to all those different outlets. So that's really well, cool. exciting. It's a, it's a weird change because I will say this, that like that there's an upside and a downside to it. The upside is very clear for people like me. I'm a total like, um, ADD, like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I want to do that. I want to do that. And 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 I I think of myself as relatively resourceful and and good at like if I you know and and, and self critical enough that if 
if it's time to make a, a movie or it's time to make a t-shirt or it's time to make a live show, I, I, I will look at the thing we've made and go, is it good enough yet? That's, so, so this new world is great for people like me. I'm, I'm not the kid who spent 95 hours playing guitar every day when I was a kid. I, I've, I mean, I'm a pretty decent guitarist only because we've been on tour for 15 years and I had to play for an hour every night. But yeah. I, like, as, a, as a kid, I just hated the idea of sitting someplace and doing the same thing for, you know, two hours in a row. And so this world is not so great necessarily for, like, the world's greatest blues guitarist. You know? Like, you, you don't want your... You don't, you don't want everybody to have to be a jack of all trades and you don't want everybody to have to be, a, like, a, a savvy businessman or a resourceful internet entrepreneur, you know, and and so it really is just a sort of paradigm shift, because I think that, you know, if, if you were that guy, who, you know, if you were Christopher Parkening and you can play classical guitar like no one else in the universe, um, it doesn't really help you that suddenly you can, you know, make a video also. Yeah. Well, this is, so I could talk to you forever, and everybody on Google Plus knows I do concerts for like eight hours, so I'm going to throw to my girl Alita, who I'm really <laughs> excited to see and I see we're so telekinesic because we both wore stripes. I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, totally unplanned, by the way. I know. I'm on the in the wrong direction. Nice. Um, so I think it's um, fairly well established that now at this point, music um, in terms of CDs or MP3s is um, almost disposable. And, you know, because everyone can download it. Or, or you know whether it's legal or illegal very quickly um, and as a result people amass huge volumes and they never even listen to it more than once um, and so now you know it's, it's the product has sort of become the concert experience um, where you uh, get that one night of something unique something intimate something that you can't um, you know just purchase on iTunes and I'm wondering, um, given this, and, and also how in bed music and technology have been, I'm wondering, um, since it seems like in all other facets, music has really embraced this sort of new media and um, new types of distribution and engaging with fans. Um, but I feel like the concert scenario has not really been updated. For the most part, it's still a very um, formulaic situation where there's Everyone's facing forward, passively listening while the band plays to them. Um, and I'm wondering if you can maybe speak to that on why you think that um, concerts have not really been updated and what you think the potential is there, in particular, um, what you guys are doing right now with OK Go and, and partnering with different corporate sponsors and seeing, like, where can this go and how can we sort of bring the concert experience into this new age of new media? Well, um... I could, I mean, that's like 700 things to talk about. And I know. <laughs> so, <700. Yeah. laughs> um, I, I think, one, uh, I don't think that music has, like, embraced technological change. It has been trod upon by technological change. You know, like, the, 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 the value in the, in the music industry, uh, not, I mean, it, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, music was basically an ephemeral experience that you would hear something and that was the experience of music. There was, a, you know, the, the, the industry that surrounded it was professional players, to a certain extent professional composers, and the music that they then distributed on paper. And then in the last century, there was a short blip of time when that when recorded music became something that was really easily... Uh, sold and commodified, and so music as an idea became recordings of music. Um, it, that basically just imploded. I mean, it's not, it's not that, that musicians are, so, are, are like, Woo, this, well, this new world is awesome. It's just like something that was worth a lot of money is now worth no money. I mean, if you could download clothes, there would be no more fashion labels, you know, or at least they would, it, it, they would, be, it would be a very different scene. Um, so I, I think one thing is that live shows... Uh, the the bottom hasn't fallen out from underneath them any more than it has. That's one thing that hasn't really been digitized. I mean, people, you know, people use. Uh, uh, I mean, I I know I'm speaking to the world's greatest Google Hangout player right now, but <laughs> as a as a as a uh, as a mass industry, uh, the the 
concert going experience hasn't found its way online and everybody who's doing like, you know, live streams and stuff, right. You know, they're making new, they're making inroads, but it's not like people go like, you know what I'm doing this Friday night. I'm going home and I'm watching my computer because my favorite band is in Tokyo tonight and it's going to be great. Right. I mean, that's, at least that's a very small group of people. So it's not really that the live show has become the product. It's just the only one that, that hasn't imploded. And, and live touring is, um, it's it's a tough thing to it's a tough thing to make money at and it's a tough thing to rewrite because it's such a tough thing to make money at basically when you can play for you know 50 to 100 people a night at a club you can also charge either zero or like maybe 5 bucks as a cover charge to get in and probably the bar is going to take it but regardless it, you know the most you're going to get is say you know, a hundred people times five bucks. So that's 500 bucks for the entire night. When you can play to a thousand people, you might be able to charge them 20 bucks. When you can, when you can play to 5,000 people, you might be able to charge them 50 or 75 bucks. And so even though your costs go up, your costs go up maybe linearly for that your the, the, the gross goes up exponentially. So bands lose a shit, sorry, a bleep ton of, of money, uh, when they're touring to and playing to less than a thousand people a night, maybe maybe you know some some bands can make it work on the five hundred to a thousand dollar, I mean thousand cap range, cap being capacity. Um, the but once you get over a thousand or so, it gets gets really super profitable. So there's not much it, it, when you're when you're when you're smaller than a thousand people a night, you don't have the the uh, resources to actually screw with the system and go like, you know what, I want to do this differently. We're going to make the audience go over there, and we want to do it with the lights facing the wrong way, and we're going to have all these people bring in their technology, and we're going to do it. It's going to be a collaborative show because that's just expensive. And once you once you're playing to twelve hundred people a night or fifteen hundred people a night, and you're actually making money you've just spent five or 10 years getting to the point where you can finally make money and you're in an extremely rigid circumstance now, which is you play, you know, go, you go from terminal five in New York to, uh, you know, the Avalon in Boston to, it's like, you know, everyone plays the same 20 or 50 clubs in America and they all have basically the same parameters and they have to get a band in there by, you know, the start load in at 10 or 11 in the morning. You have to be out by two at night. And so it's such a rigid system that if you, tried to overhaul it, you would suddenly take your profitable system into one that is now not profitable. Especially in a circumstance where those bands are now not selling records anymore, they're like the last people who are going to screw with it. Now, to try to answer the question you were probably trying, the, the more interesting question here is like, is there an, a cooler place to go or is there a better thing on the horizon? I think there is. My, my feeling is this, that like theater hasn't changed a whole lot. There's, um, there are, you know, there's, there's immersive theater stuff that's happening. There's a thing called uh, Sleep No More here in New York that I don't, I don't know if you've been to. I went this summer, yeah. Yeah, I went as part of the Future of Storytelling thing, and I don't, um, I, I don't want to be negative, but I, because uh, I think what they're trying is really awesome, but I've heard am amazing things about it, and then was sort of underwhelmed. It was. Me too. I felt like the execution was a little. The concept's great, but. I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> it, the con, the con, I mean, the idea of immersive theater is great, but it has the same problem that I have with um, using a 360-degree camera, for instance, to make a video, which has been proposed to us by every person who sells a 360-degree camera in the universe. They, um, there, there, there is the boundary because there are no boundaries to work against or work with. It's really hard to. Um, if you can't, as the maker of something, direct your audience's attention to something, you have to you have to cover all possibilities at once, and so you wind up with with a, a very loose, unstructured Destroyed. user. Mm -hmm. and it, and it, I mean, I think some people go through it and have an amazing experience, but a lot of people just sort of get lost in the eddies of like, I don't know, what is that thing? And you get stuck just not having a good time. Anyways. So theater, theater is trying to push its boundaries, but hasn't quite figured out how. You know, video, video, and video artists, and sort of interactive video. Um, again, like there, there's some really amazing things happening, but a lot of times they're really cold and really on. It's it's very hard to get um, a, a person who's immersed in a, a video space to feel like they're in contact with other humans. Rock and roll is is really stuck in its in its rut because. It, it, it's such a, a set system that people are in. Plus, it's really hard for most musicians who came up playing a bunch of instruments to go like, you know, let's let's forget about everything we're doing here and try to design a different experience. Um, so I think if you 
throw all those things into one pot and mix in a, 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 a decent technology budget, uh, truly amazing things could happen. And so we really, really, really want to do that. Um, but it is, it does take a real budget. You can't just like, it's not the sort of thing that we can do without, um, without finding sponsorship or a corporate partner. So we're looking. Cool. Yeah, because I do feel like there's, um, when you, when you look at the current model, it does seem very impossible. But I mean, as with most creative endeavors, when you scrap everything that is a given and just say, okay, let's not go by those rules anymore. Like, do we even need to do traditional concert venues anymore? No. I mean, obviously, Daria is a great example of that. Um, and, you know, the Google Hangouts give you so much potential. Um, do we need to um, have the stage be, you know, facing forward and, you know, and then fans on the other side of it facing to us? No. Like, why not have the stage be something that, you know, is in the center or, I mean, even something as simple as that, that changes the way well, that you, experience that's a, that's a great idea, but you can only do it if you've got a lot of money. You know, it's like if you're, um, the, the online space has lots of basically free venues, but the physical space, if you, mm -hmm. if you want to go play Terminal 5 with the stage in the center, they'll absolutely let you, but you're going to have to book it out for several days because it'll have to build the stage in the center and you're going to have mm -hmm. to hire extra security and you know, it's like everything about it is just going to be really expensive. And it's not, it's not a bad idea, but it's just, it, that's my point is that it's very hard for, um, it's very hard for people to push the boundaries of that because it's, it's the, the, the barrier to entry to those spaces is so economically high. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can like, you know, the band lightning bolt, they play on the floor all the time and, and, and it's, it's, it's much easier to do because a, they don't play with, I mean, they're only two people. B, they don't play on a stage, and for most of their career, they were playing in in places that held like seventy five people, and so they, like the the you know the people that ran the club were just sort of like play where the fuck you want, I don't care, you know, but like yeah. but doing doing that in in, uh, in you know doing that in a place that's actually where you, where it's you can also make a living doing it is much harder. You know, I think actually the 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 one side of the live performance stuff that is interesting and is being affected by. Uh, the sort of economy of scale of a lot of this online stuff is um, sort of crowdsourcing interest in your band. So instead of going through the traditional booking uh, agent route of saying, okay, we're going to play these 30 dates on these 30 days and, you know, we're going to go play these traditional clubs, there's been a few startups um, that are trying to basically um, let the band empower their fans to say, look, we have all these fans in this town, this town, this town, and this town, uh, and essentially pre-selling tickets to concerts that don't exist so that they can then go to promoters uh, or directly to the clubs and say, look, we've got you know, 500 people that are ready to see us play in this town. There's no risk for you, and it allows those bands to take a bigger risk. It's less um, about the sort of creative rethinking the, the live performance, but it is rethinking a lot of the standard limitations that are currently you know, in that industry. Kind of yeah, the this, model. Even this likewise, you would have some kind of too. What was that? Go ahead. No, I was saying the same thing is going on with independent film, too, where you can have uh, an audience demand screenings in their town. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same sort of thing, but go on. <laughs> oh, well, and, and even you could do that with an app where it's like, you know, the, the audience members get to um, vote on which th song they want to be the last song that's played. And obviously that takes some power away from the artist, but, you know, or, or a collaborative thing where, at, you know, that night they're submitting lyrics. And, I mean, Daria's done some stuff like this too, yeah. where, like, maybe they're submitting lyrics and, and they do some kind of jam session right then on the fly as musicians based on what they're crowdsourcing from the audience right then. And that creates a unique experience that will never be replicated because every time they do it at a concert, it's different based on who's there and what creative source there are. Yeah, I would love to jump in just for a sec because, you know, I, I totally agree with Damien and it's interesting, you know, being being a young artist who, you know, at, at sort of the, I don't know, first or the second half of the first chapter of my journey or whatever, I definitely, you know, have been thinking the same thing. How do you how do you innovate and how do you have fun in, in these different spaces, but with, you know, without having like a U2 budget, because obviously they did the, the 360 tour and they were in the middle of the floor, but they were like in a spaceship, you know, and so I've been having a lot of fun playing with things that really don't hardly cost any money at all and and uh, one of the things I mean I've literally gone from like bedroom to you know slogging it out in clubs and then thinking now that I've got this audience you know is represented by my little pins behind me like why do I want to 
necessarily be interfacing with these mean club owners and stuff like that. And and so um, I've found myself all over the world and wanting to take people with me where I go. So I've been doing simple stuff like, hey, is there already a screen at the venue? We'll hook up an internet connection. I was just in Tel Aviv and we had video walls and I had these guys in Hangouts like on the screens live interacting with the audience that was in front of me and around me. And it's cool because something will happen where I'll be in the middle of singing a note and my eyes are closed and one guy will hold up a lighter and then one guy, I think David, shout out to David. David Santee, if he's watching this one guy, had like this giant candle and it cracked everybody up and it and it didn't mess me up, it just made me giggle and it was fun and so everything becomes new every single time. So I think you can play with little things that maybe aren't too expensive but open up that window of, of other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so Andrea, I know you had a question you wanted to ask. I, I, I do. Um... Coming from uh, a lot of sort of marketing and brand work, and even uh, I guess the culture of media today, there's a lot of pressure to be the first person to do something. So you see the first live streaming single take concert, you see the first tweet from space, you know, all of, all of these first things. But being in the race to do something novel doesn't always result in particularly good work. And you know, as someone who makes stuff, you want to do your best possible work. So I, I guess I'm curious how you manage those pressures. Um, did did you? I, I may be picking at your language here, but did you actually see the first live streaming concert, or did you? No, no, actually no, I'm, see I'm not talking about you actually at no, all. No, 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 I'm, no. I'm, the reason the reason <laughs> I'm asking is because because while you said you see this and you see that, you probably actually don't see those things. Like there is some marketer out there who's trying all of them, and no one's doing <laughs> them. because novelty just does, like it doesn't work, and or, or at least that type of novelty is, um, you know, maybe five or ten years ago when the the rate of change for these technologies was comparatively glacial. Um, and people still thought, like, when I buy a computer, I'll have this computer for five or ten years, and I will use this. You know, like, it, people sort of had an expectation that there would be a standard for these things. So if you get a, you know, so every time something new happened, it felt like it was, like, starting some massive new set of standards. And now there's a new technology every 30 seconds that, that people could use to do such and such and such and such. And we get, I mean, you know, we talk to ad agencies and to, the brand, to brands all the time because that's a, a primary source of funding for us is, is figuring out how we can make our, the, our creative ideas get made. And there's almost always someone's like, you know, what we need to do is try, we have to be the first to do this stunt or this thing or that use that technology and I mean Mike can attest this because he's on all these calls with me and it's just it's so hard to bite your tongue and just be like god that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard <laughs> um, because yeah. just, and occasionally we'll even give him we'll, we'll be like look if, if we can do this part of this project that we want to do we want to do you know this video or these live shows we'll do the internet campaign that you're asking us to do but with the caveat that we're going to tell you now we will do everything you've asked us to do and it will not work um, and, and they're like, no, oh, no, of course it'll work, of course it'll work. And we're like, as long as you won't see it as a failure, when it doesn't work, we'll do it. And and it um, it's and it, it's always you know because they're like, we're the first person to have used this technology, and nobody, I mean, nobody watching this, and nobody here on this uh, on you know in this roundtable actually goes out in the in the world looking for what are the new things available today that weren't yesterday because there's going to be a new wave of them tomorrow and in fact there's probably a new wave of them by lunch and it's it, it really is about which things enable human connection and which things enable um, good work to to be to, to get to you in a more interesting way and sometimes those are really like structural changes and and, and it's just really hard to tell in the moment you know like certainly you know, a, a, a decade ago or something, the idea of playing concerts to your laptop for people around the world would have seemed like really novel, but was it going to be good? You know, and now we know that it is good. And and there's plenty of things... Thank you, Daria. And, <laughs> and there's plenty of... Sorry, I'm just going to close the door. Um, there's, there's plenty of, of equivalent things that just miserably fail. So um, I, I think that, the, you know, the easiest the easiest question to ask or at least the, the, the sniff test for me is basically when this 
technology it, that I'm using today is obsolete, will the thing I'm making still be good? And uh, like, hmm. you know, with most of our videos, for instance, we know that, that right now they're going to be seen on a, or, you know, at least when we made them four years ago, three years ago, that they're, they're going to be seen on something this big on your, on your computer, and it's like, you know, 640 by 480. But is the idea embedded in those 640 by 480 interesting enough that people will want to watch it when they're used to seeing things in you know 4D at a bajillion pixels everywhere? And and if that idea is good enough, then it's a good idea. If it's like, yeah, once once there's a cooler version of this technology, this idea won't be any good anymore, then you, you can be pretty sure that it's a crappy idea. Um, Damien, I wanted to ask you about the process of working with some of the corporate clients that you work with. I, I know that you uh, got rid of your, your record label and so one of the goals or challenges is to figure out the alternative ways to financially support the work that you do. Um, you've, you had incredible success last year at Con, where all the advertising world comes together to award the best work. I believe you won seven Lions. I love the fact that you didn't even know what that was um, <laughs> <laughs> when they invited you to come receive them. Uh, so clearly you're doing something right, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and any lessons that you have from uh, collaborating with the corporate world to do good work. Oh, boy. Patience. You know, uh, the, um, it's not, uh, there is no silver bullet, obviously. If, there, if it was really easy to set these things up, everybody would have done it already, and, um, and if every one of them worked, there'd be a lot more of them, you know. It's... Um, the the difficulty for us is is trying to figure out the balance between actually getting to make stuff and do and you know running our own business uh, like it, when we were on a major label basically this the system was figure out what uh, people I'm sorry I'm gonna ask her if she can stop vacuuming <laughs> <laughs> rock stars need to vacuum too. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, the when we were on a major label, basically you spend your day um, hollering at the major label, going like, "We want, we want more. We, you know, like pay for more promotion or give us more tour support to go here." Or do, it's like you, you, unless you are you two, the likelihood of you ever actually recouping the money they're spending on you is so low that what that your whole game is just see if you can get them to invest more in your career. And so there's a lot of there's just a lot of yelling. There's a lot of like, ah, pay attention. And when you when that when you leave the major label, at least in our case, that same amount of attention needs to be put into doing all the things they would have done, or at least the small fraction of them that you can you can afford. So um, now the th like for us, it, it's really hard to guess. How many ad agencies are you going to have to sit in meetings with? How many brands are you going to have to talk to um, to find the right one? To find you know to figure out the right way that it's going to work? Because you know ninety percent of them are just going to say no or are going to like string you along for a long time and think that maybe it's a good idea and then it's not, um, or be like yeah yeah that's exactly what we want to do and then and, you know and then at the end be like, as long as you're holding the box of cornflakes, you know, and which, <laughs> of course isn't going to work. So, um, it, and then, and then there's the last 10% where it, you, is it still a good idea? Like, have you, have you crossed the line yet? You know, like if you're making, uh, you know, I want to make this video and this video is going to have a car in it anyways. So does it matter if whose car it is? Uh, like, how much are we, how much are we willing to let this thing be co-opted as an advertisement? You know, is is does it still feel like it's my work? Does it still feel like the thing I want to do? And and you know, you can land on something that eh, might be okay, and then you don't know. Do you have to spend another six months looking for one that's better or not? And um, you know, so balancing that. I mean, Mike can also attest to this. We just spend a lot of time trying to figure out. Uh, you know, like, is it worth? taking this meeting right now because I'd rather be writing songs I need to be writing songs and if we take meetings all day long there's there's no there's you know there's no music to, to meet about mm -hmm. that answer the question I don't remember what the question yeah was. yeah <laughs> it was about vacuuming right sorry <laughs> um, so we have a, we have a couple of questions that have come in from the uh, Google Plus community and I might just run one by 
Um, so one is here, Damien, when you commit to a project, you said in your interview you have to take the initial risk. How do you know if it's a risk you should take? What are the factors for the decision? Wow. Um, well, I don't have a good answer for that because yeah. most risks, fail, you know, most gambles fail. Like the, the, the most most internet startups, you know, fail. Most restaurants fail. Most bands fail. Most like most things fail. So um, if you've got a really great idea and you think you've got a really great idea, you're probably wrong and you're probably gonna fail. But you basically <laughs> just you, thanks you for the inspiration, really Damien. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. Go for it, kids. <laughs> but that. That said, you have to believe in yourself, right? So if 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 you don't, you know, you won't know if you don't try. So, um, you know, in 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 my life or in our band's experience, it's certainly been a, a a crescendo of of sizes of gamble. You know, it's like I um, I was not one of those kids who dropped out of high school to be to, to go on tour with my cool punk rock band. Like I went to, I, you know, I graduated high school. I went to a good college. I, like. I, I got good jobs out of college and started my band at the same time. And only once the band was actually doing well enough, it was like, you know, maybe I should, maybe I can quit my job and we'll try going on tour. Did we do that? You know, and that was a comparatively small gamble versus spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a video that you have no idea if it's going to succeed. And during the course of our, you know, like we've come to trust ourselves and what we're good at and what we're not good at and where it's worth betting wildly. And, and, and it's sort of a percentage game. It's like, um, that we're we're willing to make much bigger bets now than we were a long time ago because we know there's a we know we can still go out and play shows you know we know we can still release records you know like most of the the fundamentals of a career that are pretty hard for a band to do in their first year we can do now pretty easily so taking bigger taking big you know making bigger creative investments and making bigger bets is a little easier for us um, you also I mean this. I have an internal compass about what I think is good and bad that is that is extremely consistent. I'm not sure it's always right, but it's it's. Uh, but I know what I like, you know. And uh, it, it's very hard for anyone to make something really awesome by committee, you know, or at least in in the sort of cr creative sphere. It's you know having good like I, I work really well with collaborators, and there's great and, and I will take a, a person's idea if it's better than mine, and and like generally. Um, I don't have like those type of e ego battles with the people I collaborate with, but we we're never in a situation where it's like, well, what does the label think, and how does you know? It's like if you if you get into what's going to work out there in the world, you will only make something that's exactly like what other people have already made. So um, if you don't, I, I don't think it's worth trying to start a risky venture, a rock band, a restaurant, a, a internet company, a architecture firm, I don't know, like and anything where there's a bajillion other people trying to do it, if you don't know what you think is great and know that you can, like, that when I make it, people will like it, then you should find something else to do. Well, I have, a, I can keep going with questions all day. Does anyone else want to jump in before I ask another one? I have more, but I know other people in here have a <laughs> I have one. Did you guys actually hear the vacuum cleaner, or was that just me? No, no, no we didn't. <laughs> totally out of here. So. Um, do the other guys yeah. in the hangout have a question, or should I ask one more? Uh, you know, I talk to this guy all the time. You should <laughs> Jacob? Um, yeah, okay. no, totally. I, I would love to. It's uh, It's been a while since we've seen each other. The last time was on the, the Freight Tour back in 2007. Nice to see you again, sir. Good to see you, sir. We were sitting backstage uh, in Boston, um, and my dad had flown in to see that show. And we had a conversation for about an hour, because at the time you were in the middle of figuring out Internet law. And I just oh, remember yeah. being struck by how unusual that was for a musician um, to be having one of the most uh, articulate conversations about the nuances of the legal system, uh, you know, <laughs> involving this emerging technology, and um, that made a very, a very cool impact on me. And I've, I've, you know, well, thought you. about that conversation a lot in the years. And you're now a senior connector. Well, so that brings me, I guess, to my question. So after after May, um, we we had done a pretty ambitious project for our last chapter, where we created um, 
we had a goal of connecting with our audience in an unusual way. And so we also were on Capitol Records. Uh, we had made our first record for $3,000 in a garage and uh, sold about 200,000 copies. Wow, that's fantastic. Awesome. We made a record uh, on Capitol where they spent $800,000 and we sold about 60,000 copies. And somewhere in the middle of that, the light came on for me and I said, wow, this is really broken. And, um, was it uh, the Slater years by any chance? It sure was. Yeah. yeah. Did you, um, was, was well, Hal was, involved? It was, the, it was the transition, actually, uh, between the Slater years, then into the EMI, uh, kind of the merger between Virgin and Capital. Yeah. Um, we got who, caught in the middle of that. Can I ask who produced that record? Sorry. Howard Benson. Uh, okay. Which is where a lot, of the, a lot of the money went, as you can imagine. Um, so after that experience, we were able to get out of our deal because of the the um, terra firma acquisition that followed that. There's a whole bunch of transition happening within Capitol Records. And basically yeah. they said to us, it's cheaper for us to give you X amount of dollars to walk away than it is to, to spend as much as we're committed to for record two. Mm -hmm. And so what we did with that money is we funded that same uh, garage that we had made our first record, a whole new collection of music, and we put out a song every month for 2009 and allowed our fans to donate whatever they wanted for that song. That's awesome. And yeah. made the commitment to them that we would take all of that money, because we also were not used to making money from selling records, and we would fund humanitarian projects that wow. we could collaborate with our fans on. Awesome. And so dollar by dollar, song by song, we raised over $70,000. We built a house with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we funded a series of education projects with Donors Choose. And oh, Don, you know, the, the CTO of Donors Choose was in my college band. Oh, that's too cool. Okay. <laughs> so I say all of that, I feel like what is inspiring to me right now is at the end of that chapter, I realized that we needed partners to have an impact of scale appropriate to the problems that our world faces. So as much as we were trying to do good and we used our platform as artists to connect our fans into this very specific story with us, you know, $70,000 isn't going to cut it when it comes to global warming. It isn't going to cut it when it comes to HIV AIDS or you Can know, I ask, water crisis. How did it cut it when it came to you guys paying your rent? See, that's a great question too. It, honestly, we banked on uh, the touring base that we had. We we banked on um, sustainability through touring and merchandising, uh -huh. and that worked. Except, literally on uh, two days before the last show of our second tour that year, we were uh, in Philly of all places, um, and. Our van, our trailer, and all of our equipment was stolen out of the Holiday Inn parking lot by the Philly Stadium. So it was kind of this weird end to the story that we didn't really plan on. Um, and and suddenly was... you needed a, a new humanitarian <laughs> cause with the <this> fire van. <laughs> but you know what? I'll tell you this. Our fans who had been with us this whole year on a journey in and of themselves created this fundraiser and and raised close to thirty thousand dollars to help us get back on our feet in that moment. It was a That's beautiful awesome. thing where the where all of a sudden, yeah, we were the ones who who needed something, and because they had been with us on this journey of giving throughout the year, it came back in in a very special way. But since then, the 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 senior connector part of all of this is, you know, I look at companies in this in this in this moment after being in a band um, and I see an enormous potential because they're giving incredible amounts of resources to help fund some of these humanitarian projects right. and what they don't do well is tell that story well and they don't um, they're not great at multiplying their impact um, yes. which is yeah. which is uh, like I think this is a problem for uh, I mean, it's not it's it's not limited to the music industry. I think this probably is sort of uh, storytelling wide, so to speak, and cover, covers all sorts of creative industries. Um, 
there, partnerships tend to be seen as zero sum games, where mm -hmm. if you if the art if the artist can convince you know has enough leverage, they can convince the sponsor to lay you know be so hands off that basically the sponsor gets nothing out of it. And, ha ha! I got free art. And if the sponsor has too much leverage, then they can they can sort of force this poor artist to do something really shitty. And ha ha! They got free advertising or they got cheap advertising. Yeah. And um, and and that that I mean, what's funny is is that that's never zero sum. That's less than zero sum. I mean, both people lose in that circumstance. I mean, it, like, I mean, maybe not the artist who gets fr free art, but for the most part, it's pretty hard to keep that. You, you can't sustain that business model because people quickly realize that that like it, the last time you did this, the the corporate sponsor got nothing from it. Yeah. Um, and so if you can look at these things as, if you can figure out the multiplying factors here that, that let people, uh, I mean, and I haven't even gotten onto the humanitarian part of it yet, but that, that, that let, you know, I, I, we never, using the Chevy video that we did, the, mm -hmm. the, it became a Super Bowl commercial. It was, it was a, a, a straight up rock video that, that me and my friend from college, Brian, got to direct. And... Uh, it, but it was it was also a Chevy commercial, and you know it was very clearly laid out that we were not going to shill for the product, and there was you know that there was no that it couldn't it couldn't be a traditional commercial. It had to be a rock video. But that said, I wanted to make this video anyways, right? And it was going to have a car in it anyways. There's no way I could have ever paid for the type of exposure that I got as a Super Bowl ad. You know, like they, playing it during halftime of the Super Bowl. There's no way that that thing could have had the 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 I mean of course there's no way I would have had the, the resources to make it and it was it the next day it was more viewed online than Madonna's halftime show was and so for <laughs> both both parties get get something they couldn't have gotten without the other and nobody has to do something that feels shitty yeah. um, do you, donors choose is a really great example actually donors choose um, in it when the when when the recession was at its worst. Donors choose realized that corporations wanted to be still needed to give corporate gifts, but they but they can't be seen giving out, you know, watches or vacations. So they they went and they sold they sold to corporations matching cards that basically they basically pre-sold uh, donations to schools and the and so these these big corporations would hand out gift cards. At, at, for fifty or hundred dollars, so that a normal human being could, w who had just gotten this gift card in their, you know, in their swag bag from some Citibank meeting or something, can go give a hundred dollars to a school somewhere. So that, so basically, they've already they've already pre-sold the the humanitarian part, and that person who goes online now uh, now knows about donors choose, and because of the way donors choose works, where you allot whatever dollars you want to whatever human, to whichever school project you want to pay for, it's very unlikely that that person just spent a hundred dollars. No one's going to leave twelve dollars left on their gift card, and no one's going to go. I only want to spend twelve dollars on this fourteen dollar project. So yeah. basically, most people then so so they multiply their effect both financially and and economically. If Citibank had just put that money straight into the schools, it would have had a vastly smaller effect. And so you know, and 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 donors choose. I, I can't say enough good things about donors choose. Everyone should go check them out. But there, it's it's the idea that makes them great is not the simple idea of pairing micro funders with micro problems in schools. It is it is all of the tiny stuff in between that connects those. It's it's being really smart about how every time somebody comes into that site, their their impact is multiplied by in 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 ways that sometimes they don't even know. That you know that like one of the smartest things donors choose is doing, and I know we're not supposed to be just be talking about them here. They've they they made their um they're they're granting public access to all the statistics from giving. Because, like you said, seventy thousand dollars isn't going to change any single problem. Well, they raised one hundred and fifty million dollars, but one hundred and fifty million dollars still isn't going to fix like the multi-billion or trillion-dollar problem that our schools are. Yeah. So when people like the 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 biggest complaint donors choose gets is, you can't fix the whole problem. Why are you trying to fix it at all? Well, if anybody wants to know what actually does work, when legislators want to actually make new laws about what can fix schools, they've got the largest database of, of problems and solutions that has ever existed. And anybody who wants can go do economic search, I mean, sorry, e economy searches through that. And it's, it's uh, one more way that they have taken a, a 
an already sizable impact and, and vastly uh, multiplied it. Um, I, I think those things, you know, it's, it's when when musicians, for instance, uh, talk about like speaking to their to their fans. It's like we all know we have several tiers of fans. There's like super super hardcore fans, mm -hmm. people who I know by name. You know, who people are, yep. like like there there are then a a, a sort of sub tier of 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 extremely engaged but not in your face all the time, and then there's a vast swath of people who like a few songs or something, and at least for us and probably for a lot of other bands, there's literally millions of people who have seen one video once, you know, and are like, "Oh, you're those treadmill guys or whatever," and not, <laughs> not, not recognizing that you are of a different value to these different people, and not recognizing that you need to, you need to get people to jump from one level to another, and you need to multiply the effect of your things through those tiers is a is a big mistake, and. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so when, so when you're, it, it doesn't matter for me to get up there on a, on my high horse and talk about politics or the internet or whatever if I can't get that message to pe to anyone past my tiniest fan base, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's where, you know, it wouldn't matter for me to do a. This is this is why the the novel things fail. Uh, yeah. With 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 uh, branding things like when they go, we want you to do this amazing you know Twitter game and and it's going to have this Facebook component. It's going to be incredible because it's also on Instagram and after it goes to Instagram, it goes up to the International Space Station and no one has ever done that before. <laughs> <laughs> only only people who will do that are our mega 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 fans and I don't we don't need to advertise your product to them already. Like that's you want the wide fan base. Mm. So we're, we're running a little out of time here. I'm going to ask Daria to, to pop one more question, and then I'm going to ask you one last one. Uh, so Daria, go ahead. OK, cool. So um, my other question was, uh, so sort of riffing on what you were just talking about, OK Go is definitely undoubtedly you know, one of the kings of YouTube. And, um, and then I, I've had this experience um, amazingly on Google Plus of sort of being a part of, uh, really proud to be a part of a culture that's been shaping sort of almost from the beginning. Alita and I both have, and starting hangout concerts and all that stuff. And so this is like, feels like a hometown to me. And YouTube, where obviously it's a much bigger country, like feels like a um, sort of a new country to me and I sort of like doesn't speak the language he holds no currency you know and I'm like finding my way and so as an ambassador of the YouTube universe I'm sure people ask you all the time how do you go viral but I'm I, I know as artists it's a it's a deeper more important thing than that so I would like to know if you have any insights to share about like YouTube culture and about building your community on YouTube because I'm sure you've been living on there and playing with that for a while uh, that's a better question from Mike. Uh, Mike, oh. Mike is Mike actually deals day to day with with like how it's running. You know, like what the nuts and bolts of it are. My my pretty naive take on the whole thing is uh, make awesome stuff. Yeah. Whoa, Alita. <laughs> she's um, uh, you know, I feel like uh, it, for us the the kind of aha moment was. Oh wow! If we make something that we think is really awesome, um, there are other people out there that think it's awesome. And I mean, that was a big change from the major label days. Of if we make something that's really awesome, we're going to have to find the guy in the radio department who agrees with us, and he's going to have to find the guy in the MTV office who agrees with him, and they're going to have to find the people at all the radio stations around the world. Like, uh, which means basically, there's a lot of pressure to make things that those people already like, and and. Uh, it, you know, realizing around the time of the, you know, our first homemade videos, the treadmill video and the ones right around it, um, that that something that if we just followed our internal compass really clearly, um, then we, we could make something that we really like. And if we really liked it, other people would like it. Mike, over to you for the actual smart stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, honestly, given the time we have left, it's a huge topic. I would rather um, maybe, maybe we just skip and leave it for another day. <laughs> okay. Good, good punt. Wow. <laughs> you guys are in the I mean, near area, right? So we can like do coffee and and then I'll relay the info back to the plus. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, just, for what it's worth, I don't always do one of these right after I've had two cups of coffee. So next time, I won't take up nearly as much of the bandwidth. <laughs> okay. So last question. Here's here's mine. So and it's been on my mind for a while. Uh, so the original great storytellers were these wandering minstrels, the bard that went from town to town and brought their tales and sang them and, uh, and brought news and entertainment. And um, I wonder, Damien, because I, I really think of you as kind of 
a great example of a storyteller of the 21st century. What are the skills that somebody needs? What, what is it that people need to know and, and be able to do to, to tell great impactful stories today in, in this sort of digital age? Uh, I think... Uh, I think resourcefulness is a big one. I mean, I think um, it's being able to rely on yourself or your or your collaborators or the small group of people around you to actually make things that you want to make, um, as opposed to as opposed to to plugging yourself into a giant system that that has that's efficient but um, but flexible. Uh, is really important. Um, the, every, everybody I know who's doing interesting things started it more or less by themselves, you know, or started it kind of small. Uh, um, you know, there's no, uh, I'm, we're just a couple blocks away right now from where Morgan Spur Spurlock makes, you know, ha has his films, and it's like, can you imagine Mer Morgan Spurlock trying to make Super Size Me by going into, you know, Warners and saying, like, I'd love to make this film. You know, you just, you just got to be able, you have to rely on yourself to make things. Um, and and then I think a uh, a, a sort of um, an ability to it's it's similar to the idea the the very cliche idea of thinking outside the box, but it's it's more like um, being being able to ignore old boxes and and create for yourself new boxes. Um, I, I think maybe that's the sort of the 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 point of the whole non novelty argument I keep making. Um, most of our videos, for instance, have have very 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 strict rules, and I think that's why they work. Like the the treadmill video, it's got to be one take. There's no other props. You can't you know like there's you, there can't be any edits. You can't move the camera. You can't. It's like everything you see has to happen in this very contained environment. And because that's so restrictive, pushing up against the boundaries and trying to figure out creative things to do in that is really refreshing and revealing and what and people really love watching it. The same is true for you know, our Rube Goldberg video, our, 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 the car video. The same is true for all sorts of, I mean, all of them have these very strict rules because if, if suddenly halfway through, you like you're allowed to have you know CG and or you're allowed to have new props. Then why didn't you have them the whole time? And, and now there's sort of no structure for the thing that's not interesting anymore. And in fact, pop music really works on the same basic principle. Like it's if if you it, like for me, it, 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 it there's so much about sort of melody and and familiarity. Like it has to be something that you that both feels fresh to you and is completely known to you. Like the whole like pop music is it's a language we are all already speak so like you know pure noise while it's totally novel is doesn't doesn't pull the heartstrings in the same way and i think finding those new boxes now when when the box is no longer at the edge of the cd it's no longer at the edge of of the of the page of the book it's no longer at the edge of the newspaper it's like those our our, our canvases are not laid out for us anymore so i think that yeah. Being able to ignore the old canvases and build for yourself a new canvas, that's what makes a good storyteller. Bam. <laughs> Great ending. <laughs> okay, well, listen, everyone. Damien, thank you so much for making the time. And to all of you, this was a great conversation. Um, we're so fortunate to have the power of Google Plus at our fingertips here to enable these. Uh, we're going to have a weekly roundtable, virtual roundtable, for future storytelling. So. I just want to let people know next week, Brian Seth Hurst is going to be with us. And we're talking about the changing nature of the audience. Um, and every week thereafter, there'll be another of our great speakers coming back. So we hope you'll join us again for, for another one. And thank you so much for the time. And we look forward to seeing you all at the Future of Storytelling in October. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That was fun. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Damien. <laughs> Bye. Okay. That seemed fun.